Hello there. I'm David Carrico. My wife Donna and I operate a ministry in Evansville, Indiana. We have spent several years researching various aspects of the occult and have been used by God to lead several occultists to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. One of the areas of research which we have specialized in is SRA, or Satanic Ritual Abuse. We have a burden to expose the truth about SRA and to help promote understanding for its victims. In this video, I want to share with you several aspects of SRA. We will start by defining ritual abuse. We will find within that definition several elements of satanic ritual abuse as described by survivors. Once we have a working definition, we will look at evidence of its existence. Then we will examine the claims of those who say that satanic ritual abuse does not occur. And finally, we will look at the origins of SRA and how the practice of human sacrifice has been propagated to the present day through the mystery religions. SRA involves crimes against children that are so horrible that many people don't want to believe it exists. I assure you that I don't want to believe it either, but due to the evidence, I have no choice but to acknowledge that SRA is a reality. Four states have passed laws making the ritualistic abuse of children illegal. A legal definition of ritual abuse can be found in a bill passed by the legislature of the state of Illinois. The law went into effect in January of 1993. The act states that a person is guilty of a felony when he commits any of seven acts upon a child or in the presence of a child during a ceremony or ritual. A person commits ritual abuse when he, one, actually or in simulation, tortures, mutilates, or sacrifices any warm-blooded animal or human being. Two, forces, ingestion, injection, or other application of any narcotic drug, hallucinogen, or anesthetic for the purpose of dulling sensitivity, cognition, recollection of, or resistance to any criminal activity. Three, forces, ingestion, or external application of human or animal urine, feces, flesh, blood, bones, body secretions, non-prescribed drugs, or chemical compounds. Four, involves the child in a mock unauthorized or unlawful marriage ceremony with another person or representation of any force or deity followed by sexual contact with the child. Five, places a living child into a coffin or open grave containing a human corpse or remains. Six, threatens death or serious harm to a child, his or her parents, family, pets, or friends, which instills a well-founded fear in the child that the threat will be carried out. Or, seven, unlawfully dissects, mutilates, or incinerates a human corpse. Several other states have passed laws concerning ritual abuse of children. The definition in each case is similar. In order to define satanic ritual abuse, we must first identify the nature of Satan. Satan is a fallen angel who wants to usurp the place of God in worship. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, discusses the fall of Satan from heaven when he tried to be like God. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan and a third of the angels who followed him were cast out of heaven. They are now commonly referred to as demons rather than fallen angels. Satan commands a host of demons whose nature is identical to his own. 1 Peter 5.8 warns us to be sober, be vigilant, 
because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Paul knew that all pagan religions worship demons rather than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. Demonic ritual abuse would involve any ritual abuse which took place in a ceremony which gave praise or worship to one or more demons. We know from Paul's writings that all pagan gods are demons. In warfare, a general is often given credit for the accomplishments of his troops. Since all demons have the same nature as Satan, and Satan is the leader of all demons, satanic ritual abuse includes any ritual abuse which takes place during the praise or worship of any demon or false god. Our working definition of satanic ritual abuse then requires that the ritual abuse occur as part of a ritual which worships Satan, another demon, or any false god. You may be surprised to know that satanic ritual abuse is really not a new problem. God spoke of satanic ritual abuse to Moses in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. Notice here that God speaks not only against those who would sacrifice children to the demon, but also all those who know that the sacrifice is happening and don't try to stop it. Continuing to read, and the person who turns after mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The Bible tells us that children were put to death in worship of Moloch. Additionally, sexual acts were committed as part of the ceremonies. Several other scriptures deal with the sacrifice of children to false gods. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 21 warns the Israelites not to let any of their seed pass through the fire to Molech. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. God detested the sacrifice of children to false gods so much that he wanted the Israelites to kill all men who sacrificed their children. God told Moses that he would turn his face against any man who failed to kill another man he knew had sacrificed his children. 2 Kings chapter 17 verse 31 deals with children who were sacrificed to gods other than Molech. And the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak and the Sephirvites burnt their children in fire to Adrimelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sephirvim. Verses 16 and 17 of 2 Kings chapter 17 reveal that some of the Israelites sacrificed their children to Baal. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. 
and they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Jeremiah chapter 19 verses 3 through 5 reveals that the judgment of God will fall upon any nation which allows child sacrifice. And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. Because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocents. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Since we know that all false gods are in reality demons, and all demons are following Satan, the scriptural evidence that satanic ritual abuse has occurred is uncontestable. The demonic practices of the ancient Canaanites did not cease when the children of Israel invaded the promised land. They have been passed down through the centuries within the mystery religions. The teaching of the mystery religions has been preserved in the literature and practice of several secret societies. The very fact that several states have enacted laws concerning ritual abuse demonstrates that the problem is still with us. This is really not surprising because the nature of man has not changed. The legal definitions are broad for several obvious reasons. The element of religion has not been placed in the law to prevent perpetrators from using freedom of religion as a defense. If laws applied only to satanic ritual abuse, some who worship Lucifer would deny that Lucifer and Satan are the same being. That may sound absurd, but I have seen documents from organizations which lift up, lift up Lucifer, yet deny the existence of Satan. Additionally, all ritual abuse does not contain satanic elements. The broad definition within the Illinois law serves to convict without having to prove Satanism per se. While most ritual abuse cases never come to trial, there have been several criminal prosecutions that resulted in convictions. In most cases, the ritual aspect was not introduced in court, but was clearly indicated by the accounts of the victims. Numerous civil cases incorporating claims of ritual abuse have been successfully litigated. In August 1984, there were two cases which resulted in convictions. In Niles, Michigan, Richard Barkman, the husband of a daycare operator, was convicted. In Miami, Frank and Ileana Fuster went to prison because of abuses at their Country Walk Daycare Center. The case has been impressively documented in the book, Unspeakable Acts, and in the ABC docudrama of the same title. In September 1984, in Malden, Massachusetts, the Fells Acre daycare case culminated in guilty verdicts against Violet Amaralt and her daughter Cheryl Amaralt Lefebvre. They were given sentences of from 8 to 20 years. In December 1987, in Roseburg, Oregon, three Gallup Christian daycare facilities were the scene of crimes that resulted in the conviction of a minister, his wife, and his son. Mary Lou Gallup's conviction was reversed because of a discovery violation, but Ed Gallup Sr. and Ed Chips Gallup Jr. both served their sentences. 
In the same month in Lee High, Utah, Alan Hadfield was convicted of abusing his own children in a case in which many adults in the community were identified as perpetrators of satanic ritual abuse. The case was documented in the PBS program, Promise Not to Tell. In September 1988 in Santa Rosa, California, Daryl Ball and Charlotte Thrakehill plea bargained on, mol on molestation charges and were sentenced to substantial prison terms. The prosecutor's opening statement referred to the ritual aspect of the crimes, and the child victims described satanic ceremonies that included murders. In May 1989 in Stewart, Florida, James Toward pled guilty to charges arising from the sexual abuse of over 100 children at the Montessori school where he was principal. Six children testified Toward received a 27-year sentence. His secretary received 10 years. In April 1990, in Thurston County, Washington, Paul Ingram, a former Thurston County Sheriff's deputy, confessed shortly after being confronted. Ingram had been involved in ritual abuse for many years. Two other law enforcement officers allegedly were involved, but charges eventually were dismissed because the victims were too traumatized to appear in court. Ingram was sentenced. In December 1990, in Akron, Ohio, Philip and Michael Schmidt pled guilty to molesting children who were attending the daycare operated by their grandmother, Hazel Riggs, who was sentenced on a lesser charge. The Denver Post story on the case included ritual allegations by a child victim. Prosecution was handled by the Attorney General's office. In March 1992, in Mansfield, Ohio, two teenage babysitters at the First Presbyterian Church were sent to prison for abusing children during church functions. Lawrence Road, age 19, was sentenced to 14 years, and Scott Butner received from 5 to 10 years. Children all told of being taken from the church and witnessing murder, cannibalism, and mutilation of corpses. Parents of about 60 children have urged that charges be filed against other church members who allegedly were involved, but the grand jury has declined to indict anyone else. In April 1992 in Edmonton, North Carolina, Robert Kelly, owner of the Little Rascals Daycare Center, was found guilty on 99 out of 100 counts of sexual abuse and sentenced to 12 consecutive life terms. 12 children testified in court, and one young victim described how the perpetrators would pray, oh devil, destroy these children. As of April 1993, one other defendant had been convicted, and five others remained to be tried. The most recent conviction was in 1992 in Austin, Texas. Francis and Daniel Keller were convicted. One victim disclosed how he was told that his arm bone had been taken out and replaced with Satan's. He watched them as they poured jars of blood on his arm. Ritual abuse, and more specifically, satanic ritual abuse in the name of false gods does occur today as these convictions prove. These cases represent only the tip of the iceberg. There are many victims who never come forward due to fear or in some cases death. Ritual abuse is not conducted in public but always occurs in seclusion where the risk of exposure is minimized. Those who have accidentally discovered rituals in remote areas have sometimes become victims themselves, and since ritual abuse participants are reluctant to testify against one another, many cases cannot be prosecuted because of a lack of sufficient evidence. I have become concerned with the recent criticism by those who would deny the very existence of SRA. This controversy has made it even more difficult for the victims of these satanic crimes to get help. In some cases where substantial evidence could have been provided, the cases were not investigated diligently because the prosecutors doubted the reality of SRA. 
Many times, prosecutors are reluctant to mention satanic elements of the crime when the case comes to trial, thinking that it will, ha it will make conviction more difficult. Sometimes, prosecutors and others in the criminal justice system are reluctant to do an adequate investigation in a particular case because they deny the existence of SRA. Their denial determines the course of the investigation, or rather, it prevents an adequate investigation from ever occurring. An excellent example of a law enforcement officer with this mindset is Ken B. Lanning. Lanning is a special supervisory agent assigned to the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Lanning has stated for the record, after all the hype and hysteria is put aside, the realization sets in that most satanic or occult activity involves the commission of no crimes, and that which does usually involves commission of relatively minor crimes such as trespassing, vandalism, cruelty to animals, or petty thievery. Mr. Lanning's bias regarding the existence of hardcore satanic crime has forced him to reach some ridiculous conclusions. The 1988 ritual murder trial of Clifford St. Joseph in the state of California is a case in point. These are the documented facts in the case. The corpse was mutilated so badly that it could not be identified. The corpse had been sodomized. The wrist, ankles, back, and buttocks had been slashed. The testicles were mutilated. The blood had been drained from the body. The right eye had been removed and the eye socket filled with hot wax. A pentagram was carved into the chest of the victim. After reviewing the evidence, the FBI's Mr. Lanning determined that it was not a satanic murder, but a homosexually motivated sex crime. The bias of Mr. Lanning and some others is so extreme that one wonders what evidence would be required to convince them that satanic ritual abuse exists. The traditional belief that child molesters should be held responsible for their actions and that the victims are innocent is not accepted by some in our criminal justice system. They try to attribute part of the blame to the victim, minimizing the responsibility of the perpetrator for his actions. A case in point is provided again by Ken Lanning of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Lanning wrote a chapter for the 1992 book on Satanism and ritual abuse called Out of Darkness. The book is currently published by Lexington Books. Lanning's chapter is entitled A Law Enforcement Perspective on Allegations of Ritual Abuse. In it, Lanning writes, There is another myth that is still with us and is far less likely to be discussed. This is the myth of the victim as a completely innocent little girl walking down the street, minding her own business. It may be more important to dispel this myth than the myth of stranger danger, especially when talking about the sexual exploitation of children and child sex rings. Society seems to have a problem dealing with any sexual abuse case in which the offender is not completely bad or the victim is not completely good. Society seems to find it difficult to deal with child victims who simply behave like human beings and respond to the attention and affection of offenders by voluntarily and repeatedly returning to the offender's home. It confuses us to see the victims in child pornography giggling or laughing. At professional conferences on child sexual abuse, child prostitution is almost never discussed. It is the form of sexual victimization of children most unlike the stereotype of the innocent girl victim. Child prostitutes, by definition, participate in and often initiate their victimization. Furthermore, child prostitutes and the participants in child sex rings are frequently boys. One therapist recently told the author that a researcher's data on child molestation were misleading because many of the child victims in question were child prostitutes. This implies that child prostitutes are not real victims. Whether or not it seems fair, when adults and children have sex, the child is always the victim. Examining the thinking of law enforcement officials like Lanning makes me wonder just how far some in the criminal justice system go to protect the rights of the criminal at the expense of the victim. 
I believe that any attempt to shift any part of the blame away from the perpetrator and onto the child is despicable. Isaiah wrote in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. In addition to bias within some portions of the criminal justice system, bias exists in secular media as well. A November 29, 1993 article in Time magazine is a good example. The cover story entitled, Is Freud Dead?, presented a strongly biased negative opinion against the existence of satanic ritual abuse. The article contained the following. If some of the recovered memories of familial childhood abuse sound fanciful, the recollections of satanic ritual abuse are downright bizarre. But could such satanic rituals be that commonplace, let alone exist at all? Yet law enforcement authorities report that not one shred of reliable evidence has turned up to support these claims. No documented marks of torture no bones of sacrificed adults, infants, or fetuses, and no reputable eyewitnesses. The fact that this article appeared after the previously mentioned convictions were widely publicized demonstrates that some who deny the existence of SRA have not done a credible job of research. It is also the position of this ministry that there is substantial hard evidence to prove the existence of SRA. The examples I have provided are sufficient to convince all who are objective. Only those who don't want to be confused by the facts will continue to deny the obvious. Despite the flood of hard evidence that confirms the reality of satanic crime, the backlash against the existence of SRA continues. It often takes the form of what has come to be known as false memory syndrome. The following quote is also from the Time Magazine article, Is Freud Dead? An increasing number of recovered memory accusers have recanted, and some have reunited with their families and joined them in suing the therapists and clinics they claim led them astray. Many of them are among the more than 7,000 individuals and families who have sought assistance from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. A Philadelphia-based organization that has taken the lead in publicizing the wrongdoing and in helping the victims of recovered memory therapy. Pamela Freud, who co-founded FMSF in 1992, has yet to be reconciled with her accuser daughter. The so-called false memory syndrome has become the biggest weapon in the arsenal of those that would deny the existence of SRA. The facts concerning false memory syndrome are the following. False memory syndrome is not a recognized medical or psychological diagnosis and does not appear in the American Psychi Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM-3, or the soon-to-be-released DSM-4. False memory syndrome is the invention of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation was founded in March 1992 by a couple whose daughter, a doctor with degrees in psychology, had privately accused them of sexual abuse and molestation. The daughter did not make her charges public until August of 1993. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation has certainly succeeded in making it more difficult to convict child molesters by discrediting the testimony of children. We believe the motivation for the invention of false memory syndrome becomes apparent when the writings of FMS board member Ralph Underwager are examined. His article was printed in the Journal of Pedophilia, Volume 3, Number 1, 1993. A pedophile is an adult who prefers to have sex with children rather than other adults. Underwager wrote, Pedophiles spend a lot of time and energy defending their choice. I don't think that a pedophile needs to do that. 
pedophiles can boldly and courageously affirm what they choose. They can say that what they want is to find the best way to love. I am also a theologian, and as a theologian, I believe it is God's will that there be closeness and intimacy, unity of the flesh between people. A pedophile can say, this closeness is possible for me within the choices that I've made. Underwagger continued, pedophiles are too defensive. They go around saying, you people out there are saying that what I choose is bad, that it's no good. You're putting me in a prison. You're doing all these terrible things to me. I have to define my love as being in some way or other illicit. What I think is that pedophiles can make the assertion that the pursuit of intimacy and love is what they choose. With boldness they can say, I believe this is in fact part of God's will. Underwagger's article demonstrates that at least some of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation Board are advocates of pedophilia and possibly other deviant behaviors. This could be why they have an interest in the existence of False Memory Syndrome. The hard evidence for the existence of SRA does not depend solely upon recovered memories as some would have us to believe. Recovered memories do, however, play a key role in SRA investigations because the abuse encountered in SRA is so severe that it will force the person to disassociate to deal with the pain. Disassociation is a defense mechanism that develops in people that experience situations that are too severe for them to face. The body is designed to go into shock when harsh experiences are encountered. Many people who are severely injured in automobile accidents don't remember anything except waking up in the hospital. People who are subjected to repeated abuse learn how to imagine themselves to be somewhere else or even to be someone else while the abuse is going on. This is disassociation. Repeated disassociation will result in repressed memories and usually MPD or multiple personality disorder. But are all recovered memories to be taken at face value and not questioned? Are some recovered memories false? Consider the following criticism from the Time article, Is Freud Dead? In the course of the therapy, many of these troubled souls conjure up exquisitely detailed recollections of sexual abuse by family members encouraged by their therapist to reach deeper into the recesses of their memories often using techniques such as visualization and hypnosis. Some go on to describe events that sorely strain credulity, particularly tales of their forced childhood participation in satanic rituals involving animal and infant sacrifices as well as sexual acts. All recovered memories cannot be taken at face value. There are therapeutic methods which can create delusion in the patient. The altered state is the doorway to the occult. Every person who has been heavily involved in occult practice has experienced altered states of consciousness which were self-induced or were the result of their participation in occult rituals. When a therapist uses methods such as visualization and hypnosis with someone who has experienced altered states of consciousness as a result of occult ritual, it is like throwing gasoline on a fire. The victim can revert back into an altered state of consciousness. In my opinion, such therapy itself constitutes abuse, which can be similar in nature to what the victim has previously experienced. We do not doubt the integrity or the sincerity of people who use visualization and hypnosis to treat victims of SRA, but we do believe these inappropriate practices can lead to false recovered memories. All recovered memories are certainly not false. The obvious example is the person who has recovered from amnesia. Prior to recovery, they may not know their own name. The fact that they have a spouse and children, as well as other information about their life and identity. However, there are numerous cases where complete recovery has occurred. Sometimes such recovery occurs suddenly, while in other cases, the recovered memories return gradually. There are a number of credible therapists, psychiatrists, and Christian ministries 
working with SRA victims who do not use visualization or hypnosis. The implication that all recovered memories are the result of visualization or hypnosis is simply false. The Holy Spirit can help us remember. As God heals the hurts, the Holy Spirit can bring back memories. When the person is strong enough to deal with them, God can bring the memories through prayer and spiritual healing. The origins of satanic ritual abuse go back to ancient Babylon. The scripture says that the Babylonian mysteries will form the backbone of apostate religion during the last days. Revelation chapter 17 verses 4 through 5 declare, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. The Babylonian mystery religion was started by Nimrod and his wife Semiramis. According to Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian who lived during the time of Jesus, Nimrod was the builder of the Tower of Babel and was the first man that Satan tried to use to set up a new world order. Nimrod was apparently killed because of his open and public displays of wickedness. Herein lies the real reason for the establishment of the secret mystery religion. It was not created out of any desire to spread the real truth about God, but only to protect themselves from public outcry and retribution because of the wicked acts that they were committing. Reverend Alexander Hillsop's book, The Two Babylons, explains that although Babylonian religion was originally practiced in the open, it became necessary to conceal it. Hillsop writes, It seems to have been now only when the dead hero was to be deified that the secret mysteries were set up. The previous form of apostasy during the life of Nimrod appears to have been open and public. Now, it was evidently felt that publicity was out of the question. The link between human sacrifice and the mystery religions can be established beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Dictionary of Satanism by Wade Baskin describes the rite of Dionysus. They sound similar to the stories that are told by present-day satanic cult survivors. Dionysus, in classical mythology, the god of wine and fertility. His cult was widespread in Thrace, where the Thracian women were particularly dedicated to his orgiastic rites. The women, Maenads, in their ecstatic frenzy, abandoned their homes, roamed the fields and hillsides, dancing, swinging their flaming torches. In their passion, they caught and tore apart animals, sometimes even children, and devoured the flesh, thus acquiring communion with the divinity. The Dionysanic mysteries were observed in a number of different places. The ceremonies, which were orgiastic, required drinking of sacred wine, eating of the raw flesh of a sacrificed animal, and drinking the blood of the animal. The ultimate purpose of the cult's ritual was an assurance of immortality. We began our discussion of SRA by defining it. Once we have a good working definition, we examine the evidence of its existence and consider the claims of those who want to deny that SRA does in fact continue today. We have examined the origins of SRA. At this point, I am going to document how the practice of human sacrifice has been propagated to the present day through the mystery religions. There are groups and institutions today which have preserved and continue to promote the teachings and practices of the ancient mystery religions. Unfortunately, there are many such organizations and secret societies that still exist today. They continue to teach the core doctrines and practices of the ancient mystery religions. I will provide you with a good overview of the major groups and the founders and leaders of these groups. Finally, I will introduce you to someone who is involved with several of these groups before accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior.
Witchcraft is one of the world's oldest religions. Those who practice witchcraft as religion today worship the goddess Diana of the pagan mysteries as the queen of the witches. One of the significant figures responsible for laying the foundation for the modern witchcraft revival was British witch George Pickingill. Pickingill lived in England from 1816 to 1907. He was the leader of nine witchcraft covens that were known for expressing very strong opinions against Christianity. Later, a British witch named Alex Saunders became the founder of the Alexandrian School of Witchcraft. He became known as the King of the Witches. Saunders was initiated into witchcraft by his grandmother in a sexual rite. The man who is most responsible for the modern witchcraft revival is Gerald Gardner. Gerald Gardner, shown in this photograph, is the founder of what is known as the Gardenian School of Witchcraft. Gardner was a sadomasochist who used heavy scourging and had, as his great right, sexual intercourse between the high priest and high priestess while the rest of the coven watched. The Rosicrucians are an occult organization that traced their origins to Christian Rosencruz, a man who died one year after the 1484 birth of Martin Luther. Rosicrucian doctrine is a strange mix of teachings from different pagan religions blended with an assortment of occult practices. Elias Asimov was one of the trailblazers of Rosicrucian thought in the 17th century. In the 19th century, Rosicrucian Eliphas Levi, shown in this photograph, drew the famous drawing of the Baphomet. Levi's drawing of Baphomet is shown here. It has become a favorite icon of witches and Satanists. In this country, Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer founded a Rosicrucian Society in Quakertown, Pennsylvania in 1908. Although Clymer died in 1966 at the age of 87, the Rosicrucian Society in Quakertown still exists today. This article appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer on August 20, 1990. The article states that the Rosicrucians were so secret that few residents of East Rock Hill Township knew the Rosicrucian campus was there and had been there for almost 90 years. The newspaper article correctly reported that Rosicrucians believe in reincarnation, and they believe that one day Dr. Clymer will return in a different body to resume his work at the Rosicrucian campus. The Rosicrucian Society claims that it is a fraternity, not a religion. They believe that once people become aware of the divinity within themselves, they can begin to control the forces of the universe. Members of the Rosicrucian order are allowed to belong to mainstream churches, and in fact, they have infiltrated many churches, passing themselves off as Christians. In the 19th century, the Theosophical Society was founded in New York by Colonel Henry S. Alcott, William Q. Judge, and the woman that was to become known as the mother of the New Age movement, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. After her death, the mantle of theosophy passed to a woman named Annie Besant. She led the Theosophical Society with the help of Charles Leadbeater. Today, the New Age teachings of the Theosophical Society are leading the way toward the formation of a one-world government and a one-world religion. They are teaching their followers to wait for the impending arrival of their world savior, Lord Maitreya.
Late in the 19th century in England, one of the most influential occult groups of all time was formed. It was known as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The order was founded by three men, Dr. Woodman, Wynn Westcott, and S.L. McGregor Mathers. Woodman, Westcott, and Mathers all were accomplished to call evangelists. Mathers and Westcott were prolific writers as well. Mathers translated into English two of what are considered the most potent books of magical rituals. Mathers is the man who taught the principles of ritual magic to Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley is shown here. Another member of the Golden Dawn who contributed to the flood of occult literature which it produced was Arthur Edward Waite. Waite is shown in this photograph. Waite authored many books including the Book of Black Magic. The Book of Black Magic contains four pages of instructions to conjure Emperor Lucifer, Prince of Rebellious Spirits. Waite also wrote a book titled The Holy Kabbalah in which he plumbed the depths of hidden meaning contained in the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is a book of occult Judaism, Hebrew witchcraft, if you will. The very term Kabbalah was enough to strike fear into the heart of an Orthodox Jew. Waite is considered by occultists to be one of the greatest students of the Kabbalah. The late 19th century also saw the founding of the OTO, or Ordo Templar Orientis. The OTO was founded by Carl Kellner and Theodore Roos. The OTO is known for the practice of sexual magic as revealed in the writings of their famous leader, Aleister Crowley. Crowley deserves to be called the father of modern Satanism. He laid the foundation for the doctrines of the Church of Satan in his writings. While he was the head of the OTO, he positioned them as the elite of the occult world. I've given you a good overview of the major groups which promote the teachings of the ancient mystery religions, with one notable exception. That organization is the largest, most powerful, and influential of the occult groups which exist today. I know that this may sound hard to believe at first, but that organization had more than one of our presidents as members. Before I identify the largest group promoting the mystery religions today, I want to review the other organizations because they all have something in common. I explained that the major leaders of witchcraft were George Pickingill, Alex Saunders, and Gerald Gardner. Eliphas Levi and Elias Asmo and Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer were leaders in Rosicrucianism. The leaders of the Theosophical Society were Colonel Henry S. Alcott, William Q. Judge, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Annie Besant, and Charles Leadbeater. The founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn were Dr. Woodman, Wynne Westcott, and S. L. McGregor Mathers. Aleister Crowley and Arthur Edward Waite were also key players in the Golden Dawn. The OTO, or Ordo Templar Orientis, was founded by Carl Kellner and Theodore Roos. Aleister Crowley was also a key player in the OTO. Now what is it that all of these occult leaders have in common? Well, they were all Freemasons. Each of these individuals was a member of the Masonic Lodge at the same time they were active in the occult organization which they were identified. The Masonic Lodge is the largest, most powerful, and influential occult secret society in existence now or at any time in recent history. There were two women in the group of occult leaders which I named. Possibly you have heard membership in the Masonic Lodge is only for men. Well, in Europe, they have what is called co-masonry. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Annie Besant were both masons in good standing in European lodges. Annie Besant is shown here with other masons. The caption below the photograph identifies her as Brother Annie Besant. 
Masonry encompasses many groups which have a presence in local communities, both large and small. Men become Masons by going through a series of rituals which are known as degrees. The first degrees of Masonry, the Entered Apprentice, the Fellowcraft, and Master Mason rituals are conducted in secret in what is known as the Blue Lodge. It is known as a Blue Lodge because the ceiling is painted blue to represent the color of the sky. Sometimes more than one group of Masons who constitute a Blue Lodge will use the same building at different times or on different days. This building is used by several Blue Lodges. It also contains office space for the ruling Masonic body, which is known as the Grand Lodge. Other secret Masonic rituals are conducted in the Scottish Rite, the York Rite, and Mystic Shrine. The building shown here is located in Indianapolis, Indiana. It is the home of the largest body of Scottish Rite Masons in the United States. Many Masonic books found in the library of this Scottish Rite Cathedral promote the teachings which were the central theme of the ancient mystery religions. Thousands of men have taken part in occult rituals in this building. The founders of the occult organizations we have described, including the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and the OTO, and those who led the revivals of witchcraft, were all Freemasons. Some of these occult groups continue to encourage their more dedicated disciples to become Masons in order that they might continue to grow in occult knowledge. Bill Schneblin is a case in point. Before accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, Bill was the high priest of several covens of witches. Well, the reason I joined the Lodge is probably a little bit different than, than the reason that I'd probably say 999 out of 1,000 Masons joined the Lodge. I, at the time, I was a witch, and I had, I had probably about two years earlier gotten the high priesthood of witchcraft, and the man that brought me through that was a grandmaster druid who was also um, a 33rd degree mason. And he was the first person to suggest that there were really important things in the area of the secret doctrine that could be gained by joining the Masonic Lodge. And then, as a witch, if you understand witchcraft, there's a you start out and you think you're a white witch. Uh, not not a racial term, but just that you're a good witch. And then, as you as you progress, uh, you gradually get revealed to you the fact that there's this dark side of witchcraft, uh, the shadow, the the dark side of the force. Maybe to use a Star Wars term, and uh, that this force can best be accessed through Lucifer. And then very quickly on after that, my teachers, both physical plane teachers and also my, my if you want to say spirit guides, they were actually demons now, I believe, but these people uh, would tell me, if you really want to progress into, into Satanism, uh, which is really essentially the higher, if you want to say, levels of witchcraft, then you need to go and get your Blue Lodge degrees and either take the York Rite or the Scottish Rite. So, I joined the lodge because basically it was suggested to me by witches and um, when I, of course, they, they do the interview and they come to your home and talk to you and um, they asked me if I believed in, in, in a supreme being and I said yes and of course the supreme being I believed in was the horn god of witchcraft and, and it was no business of theirs. I could have believed that the supreme being of the universe was a doorknob as far as masonry is concerned and they wouldn't have cared. And so they welcomed me into their fold and uh, basically took me in and initiated me, passed me, and raised me to the sublime degree of a Master Mason in about a year. And that's, that's how I got in. The History of Freemasonry, written by Masonic scholar Albert Mackey and published by the Masonic History Company, honors Nimrod as a great Mason. Mackey argues that Nimrod deserves the distinction of being called the first Grand Master. The universal sentiment of the Masons of the present day is to confer upon Solomon, king of Israel, the honor of being their first Grand Master. But the legend of the craft had long before, though there was a tradition of the temple extant, bestowed at least by implication that title upon Nimrod, the king of Babylonia and Assyria. A multitude of pagan gods are contained in Masonic literature. The History of Freemasonry, written by Masonic scholar Albert Mackey, contains representations of Ashtaroth, 
Dagon, Vishnu, Baal, Abraxas, the god of Gnosticism, the god of Mendez, and many others. Speaking of pagan deities, Mackey wrote in the text, they were all characters of human origin in the mythologic ages designed as the saviors of men, each one emphatically the representative Christos or Christ of his particular nation and the religious system designed to restore the lost and fallen race of man. Now as Masons, we decide not between these, but take all in as our brethren and the one God as our Heavenly Father revealed to us as such in the great light of Masonry. There is certainly no shortage of testimonies by Masonic authorities to the relationship of Freemasonry and the mystery religions. Joseph Fort Newton was a 33rd degree Mason who served as past Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lodge of Iowa and past Grand Prelate of the Grand Encampment of Knights Templar of the United States. According to Fort Newton, Masonry is the spiritual descendant of the mysteries. In his book, The Builders, Newton writes, Masonry stands in this tradition, and if we may not say that it is historically related to the great ancient orders, it is their spiritual descendant and renders much the same ministry to our age which the mysteries rendered to the olden world. The connection between Freemasonry and the ancient mystery religions is shown even in the architecture of Masonic buildings. The House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. is a case in point. The focal point of the temple room is a black stone altar. The black stone altar is a significant symbol in witchcraft and Satanism as well as in Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Behind the black stone altar, steps lead to an elevated throne where the sovereign grand commander presides over the occult rituals of the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Large carvings of intertwined snakes are prominently displayed on both sides of the throne. Since the Garden of Eden, the symbol of the snake has been universally recognized as a representation of Satan. Snakes are displayed even on the exterior of the building above the main entrance. The literature of Freemasonry is rich with occult symbolism. Surprisingly, some Masonic literature contains instructions on conjuring demons, and some is so blatant as to openly discuss human sacrifice. A case in point is The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manley Palmer Hall. Hall's book is recommended in books such as A Bridge to Light, which are published under the authority of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Others who are in a position to recognize the elements of Satanism have also noticed the similarities between Satanism and Freemasonry. Anton Sandar LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan and the author of the Satanic Bible, also wrote a book entitled The Satanic Rituals. The Satanic Rituals describes in detail the rites of Lucifer. LaVey describes the Luciferian ritual known as the ceremony of the stifling air. He notes that a slightly altered version of it is embodied in the ritual of the ancient Arabic order, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, another Masonic organization. He writes, the original Templar's rite of the fifth degree symbolically guided the candidate through the Devil's Pass in the mountains separating the East from the West, the Yazid Domain. At the fork of the trail, the candidate would have an important decision either to retain his present identity or strike out on the left-hand path to Shambhala, where he might dwell in Satan's household, having rejected the foibles and hypocrisies of the everyday world. A striking American parallel to this rite is enacted within the mosques of the ancient Arabic order of the nobles of the mystic shrine, an order reserved for 32nd degree masons. The nobles have gracefully removed themselves from any implication of heresy by referring to the place beyond the devil's pass as the domain where they might worship at the shrine of Islam.
It really makes little difference whether Shriners worship Allah or the devil. Both are demons. Please understand that I am not saying that all Masons are involved in satanic ritual abuse or that even the majority of them are. However, Masons who are Satanists are said to use the cover of Masonic secrecy and sometimes Masonic buildings to perform their abuse. Are there Satanists in the Masonic Lodge today? I asked that question of Bill Schneblin. Well, as to whether or not there are many Satanists within the Masonic Order, uh, I, I personally think there are. I, I know that, that virtually every high-level Satanist that I knew was also a Freemason. Now, that's, of course, that's not a real good statistical sample because I only knew maybe five or six of them. But, but you look at the list of, of the men in this century who were the movers and shakers of occultism, witchcraft, and Satanism, and virtually every single one of them was a Freemason. And there is something about Freemasonry that attracts these people. They know that it is a, a, a very large, popular, secret society that because of its very nature, it lends itself to having secret societies within secret societies. And so it's, it's like a, a shell or a framework into which uh, these people that are Satanists can move and to, again, by kind of trolling the, the waters, so to speak, they can begin to sane out the people who are uh, really interested in first the occult, and then they go through a little filtration process, and they find those that are interested in witchcraft, and then they filter them out even more, and they find those people that are into witchcraft that are, want to get into black witchcraft, which is, of course, Satanism. And all you have to do is look at the, the symbolism, especially within the Scottish Rite, and even within the New York Rite and the Knights Templar Commandery, and you will see over and over again symbols that are used that are outright satanic. I mean, there, there's, there's not even any question that these symbols are satanic. And, and of course, the Knights Templar, who, were, uh, who are very prominently figured in Masonic lore, were, of course, uh, prosecuted and condemned as demon worshipers and, and black magicians in the uh, 14, I mean, probably 1300s. So, you know, it's no wonder that Satanists come to this. It's because it's a fertile breeding ground for them in more ways than one. All Freemasons are involved in the occult. This is an obvious truth that is a great embarrassment to so-called Christian Masons. Occult means hidden or secret, and those are certainly the characteristics that describe Freemasonry. This secrecy carries into the home of every Freemason because he is not even allowed to share Masonic secrets with his wife. In the epilogue of George Steinmetz's book, The Royal Arch, Its Hidden Meaning, a discussion of Masonic occultism is found. Many Freemasons shudder at the word occult, which comes from the Latin meaning to cover, conceal from public scrutiny, and the profane. But anyone studying Freemasonry cannot avoid classifying Freemasonry among occult teachings. The fact that Freemasonry is indeed occult is plainly admitted by Manley Palmer Hall. Hall was described in, in his obituary in the Scottish Rite Journal as Masonry's greatest philosopher. Hall in the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. The Masonic Order is not a mere social organization, but is composed of all those who have banded themselves together to learn the principles of mysticism and the occult rites. Once Satan gets someone into the occult, it is his desire to draw that person in deeper and deeper and further away from Jesus Christ. Masonry is one of Satan's most effective tools to ensnare men in the occult. It is relatively easy to show how the Lodge is used as a means to lead men into the depths of occultism. In my home state of Indiana, the Indiana Monitor and Freemason's Guide is given to every man that becomes a Master Mason. This book plainly tells the new Mason that when he was initiated into Freemasonry, he was given merely the pathway to knowledge. And to find out what Freemasonry is really all about, he will have to read and study on his own. In the ceremonies of making a mason, we do not attempt to do more than to indicate the pathway to Masonic knowledge, to lay the foundation for the Masonic edifice. The brother must pursue the journey or complete the structure for himself by reading and reflection. When our ritual ends, we have but given him a pattern 
a blueprint, so to speak, for the erection of his own personal temple. Let us suppose that the new Mason takes the advice of the Grand Lodge of Indiana and begins to explore the real meaning of masonry through Masonic literature. One of the books that is recommended to him on the pages of the Indiana Monitor is The Builders by Joseph Fort Newton. The Builders has a rich bibliography of Masonic literature. Newton wrote the following at the beginning of the bibliography. The text and notes of the foregoing pages indicate often with brief characterizations such books as the writer found particularly helpful in the course of his study, whereof he makes acknowledgment. In chapter four of The Builders, the searching Mason would read a glowing tribute to another Masonic author, Arthur Edward Waite. The tribute covers four pages. Perhaps the greatest student in this field of esoteric teaching and method, certainly the greatest now living, is Arthur Edward Waite, to whom it is a pleasure to pay tribute. Beginning as far back as 1886, Waite issued his Study of the Mysteries of Magic, a digest of the writings of Eliphas Levi, to whom Albert Pike was more indebted than he let us know. The new Mason has learned the title of another book authored by a Mason and also the names of two other popular Masonic authors. If the new Mason would read the recommended book, The Mysteries of Magic, he could learn the perverted satanic doctrine that Lucifer is the Holy Spirit. From Waite's book we read, what is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name of Lucifer to the devil? That is, to personified evil. The intellectual Lucifer is the spirit of intelligence and love. It is the parcelate. It is the Holy Spirit. While the physical Lucifer is the great agent of universal magnetism. Many Masonic books contain occult teachings. Arthur Edward Waite was a prolific Masonic writer and a recognized Masonic authority. He wrote many other books which are widely read by Masons and Satanists. This Masonic encyclopedia was written by Waite and is currently available from the leading Masonic suppliers. Waite also wrote The Book of Black Magic. It contains material which leaves little doubt about what they are teaching. The excerpts from the rituals in Waite's book on black magic will show you how deep into the occult Masonic authors can take a new Mason. Beginning on page 244, are four pages of detailed instructions to conjure Lucifer. Because of the content of the following excerpts, I will refrain from reading them out loud. The most popular Masonic book, The Builders, praises Waite's book as a series of volumes noble in form, united in aim, unique in wealth of revealing beauty, and of unequaled worth. Newly initiated Masons could also be exposed to the writings of another highly recommended Masonic authority, 33rd degree Mason Manley Palmer Hall. In the Scottish Rite Journal's November 1990 issue, Hall's obituary refers to him as Masonry's greatest philosopher. Hall's masterpiece, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, is listed in the latest McCoy Masonic Publishing Company catalog. It contains detailed instructions on how to conjure and control demons. One brief quote from this book will quickly prove the fact. The quote contains an example pact which a Masonic occultist or other Luciferian would make to secure the services of a demon that he had conjured. Once again, because of the nature of the quote, I will refrain from reading it out loud. This is from The Secret Teachings of All Ages.
Hall's obituary in the November 1990 issue of the Scottish Rite Journal stated, and I quote, Hall did not teach a new doctrine, but was an ambassador of an ageless tradition of wisdom that enriches us to this day. The secret teachings of all ages is also known by an alternative name. Its formal title is an encyclopedic outline of Mersonic, Hermetic, Quabalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy. The obituary referred to this encyclopedic outline as being one of his four best known books. Manley P. Hall wrote a 26-page foreword for a book published by the Mother Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite called Your Amazing Mystic Powers. This book was written by Henry C. Clausen, 33rd degree, the Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite. The cover of the book shows the throne room of the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., and in that room we can see the black stone altar and the elevated throne with golden snakes on each side where Clausen was seated during the rituals. I want to draw your attention to the emblem